Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Slow Art Friday. My name is Christy McMillan, and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum. And I'm joined by one of our wonderful touring docents, Barbara Heller, who is here to guide our conversation today. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple, slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Barbara will lead us in an interactive conversation about four artworks in our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each one. Barbara will allow us time to look at each work on our own, slowly, before leading a conversation with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Barbara, myself, and each other throughout the hour. A few notes before we get started. You probably noticed that your microphone and video were muted as you got logged on. We invite you to turn on your video at any time so that we can have a conversation with talking heads instead of black boxes. And in just a moment, I'll also make it so that you can unmute your microphone. For best experience, choose a quiet room and close the door. Please do silence any alerts from nearby devices so that um, we do, don't have any interruptions during the program. If you do turn on your video, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong source of light or movement as it makes it difficult for us to see you. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. While you can log on using a smartphone, we do recommend using a desktop, laptop, or tablet in order to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial or first name and last name, again, so that we know who we're talking to. There are three ways to participate during today's program. The easiest and most efficient way is just to unmute your microphone when Barbara or I ask for questions or comments and to jump right into the conversation. A second way is to type any comments or questions that you have in the chat box. A third way is to raise your hand in the participant sidebar, and I will call on you and ask you to unmute your microphone. Typing in the chat box and raising your hand can slow things down a little bit, um, especially when we have a conversation that's actively moving right along. So please do feel free to unmute your microphone when you have a question or a comment to make. Finally, we are recording, so if you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit any questions or comments that you have. Before we get started, does anyone have any questions? All right, I've made it so that everyone can unmute yourselves um, at will. Um, please do leave your microphone off unless you're actively asking a question or making a comment just to reduce any distractions to the program. Barbara, what will we be talking about today? You're muted, Barbara. <laughs> I certainly was. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Glad you're all here. Um, obviously, my docent picture has to be updated like my license. Um, I'm pandemic gray. Um, today, we will be talking about weaving women. We have four um, arts and crafts um, that we will be looking at individually and comparing. Um, I, as Christy mentioned, Slow Art gives you a chance to take a look at each artwork and then um, we'll discuss what it evokes for you, um, what you think, any feelings you have about the pieces, um, and we'll go from there. So Christy, why don't you put up the first slide? Okay, very simple. Let's take a few moments and take a look at what this is. So what is it that we're seeing? And please unmute yourself. It looks like a woven basket and I like the, the colors, very simple, two-tone and uh, the pattern. I mean, this is something that I would like to own in my home. Thank you, Laurel, very good. Um, certainly is a woven basket um, and you've noticed a lot of its traits, the, the uh, dual colors and the uh, interesting pattern. Um, 
what else what else do we see i see the the basket seems on the on the front image to be very tightly woven, but then when you look inside, you see some light coming through in certain parts. So it's just fascinating to me at how tightly this can be woven together and it must take a lot of uh, effort to, to do, to accomplish. Good, um, and, and, and I think it's interesting that you noted that you can see different things from the inside and the outside. Um, and how tightly woven, and that's a difficult thing to do, that the basket is. Um, yes, I'm assuming that uh, because it's the Asheville area, perhaps it's Cherokee, grass woven or reed woven. I'm familiar with the Northwest Indian, Native Indian, Native culture baskets uh, that use more color but uh, it looks very similar. I, I Do you know what kind of fiber is being used? Good, it, it definitely is a Cherokee basket. Um, I was gonna ask you that a bit later, but certainly this is um, a basket of river cane, river cane and walnut dye. And river cane was very abundant, but very difficult to harvest. Um, it's sort of like a, it looks like a false bamboo. It has to be cut down and it has to be um, sliced and stripped. Um, and then also a lot of the, the person who made this basket and other Cherokee baskets are usually made from natural dyes. Barbara, I, now that you mentioned the technique of stripping it, it's amazing how uniform every what did you say it was grass or reed or something? It's every every strip is very uniform mm -hmm. in width. Yes, um, a good, another good point. Just how exact this is from very unexact materials. Um, Barbara, over in the chat box, Jay had said um, it's a geometric pattern. Jay, do you want to expand on that at all or leave it at that? Sorry, I have barking dogs. It's um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think with the geometric pattern, it reminds me a little of Islamic influence, perhaps, or just something from the Middle East. I mean, what do you think, Christy or, or Barb? Is there some of that with the geometric patterns, or did that originate with the Cherokee and all that? I, good question. I'm not sure. My understanding is that a lot of cultures um, had, you know, very similar geometric patterns. Okay. Um, and I don't know um, specifically about pieces that you would be talking about, but I think about this, these kind of geometric pieces like <clears throat> do, um, quilting. Right. You know, they're, right. They're, the patterns. I think baskets have those uh, kind of patterns as well. Um, do they have how, names? How the? I'm sorry. I, do the do the patterns have names? Like quilt patterns have have names? Good, just, good question. Yes, they do. <laughs> oh. um, and uh, some of them are things like chief's daughter, uh, peace pipe, uh, a, a coffin on the hill. Um, I couldn't find this pattern anywhere else. I found, and I don't know if you have a pointer, Christy, the, um, the shapes that have the plus sign in the middle, yeah, look like what's called Chief's Daughter. But the other ones, the ones that have the diagonal lines, I'm not sure what that design is called. Um, and um, why don't we go to the slide that has the information? This basket was made by um, a Cherokee, a third generation um, Cherokee basket maker, Rowena Bradley. Um, obviously, again, out of uh, woven river cane with walnut dye. Um, Bradley learned how to make these baskets when she was like six or seven, and she made them for her whole life. Um, she also did a very intricate 
uh, weaving technique. So everything about this basket is labor intensive. The gathering of the materials, the preparation of the materials, and the special woven technique, which is called double weave, uh, which I could not find a good example online, but it's the inner basket doesn't exactly mirror the outer basket. It's, it's like, opposite. excuse me? It looks like the opposite coloring. Right. And it's that it's done in a particular way that you're weaving almost two baskets at the same time. Um, and towards the end of her life, Bradley sadly said, I will be honest and say that a generation or two, I think, basket in a generation or two, basket weaving among the Cherokees will die out because the children take no interest like they used to. Um, I've been very encouraged in Asheville because the Center for Craft, um, in collaboration with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and a master Cherokee basket maker, is right now creating a public parklet, a small park in downtown Asheville on Broadway. Uh, with the goal of educating people about the Cherokee culture and traditions. And the parklet is called the basket. Um, so I can um, also say that at the high school in Cherokee, the new high school, um, the uh, students are being taught um, how to weave um, as part of their art uh, curriculum. Oh, I love that. I love that. I would love to be able to sit in in a class. Judy? Um, if you have time, I, I'm interested in um, this, the pattern, the, pa the different patterns and pattern names and all, all that stuff. So um, how, so do you know if patterns are like handed down or if they have particular symbolic meaning to families or to the basket maker or to anything else. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of some of the quilts that were made by enslaved people um, coming over from West Africa and how it related to sometimes to uh, folklore, their religions or... Um... I'm certainly, good, good questions, but I'm certainly not an expert on that, but we can guess from some of the names like uh, Chief's Daughter, Chief's Coffin, um, I think that these are very geometric patterns. And I think that for some people, they were just experimental. And for some people, then they became copied. Um, that if you look at on YouTube at contemporary uh, basket making classes, you'll see a lot of imitation of these old traditional designs. So someone in the chat asked, how old is this basket? And I'm, and I'm wondering too, um, how old is the basket? And, and if it's a new basket, are, well, I guess these are traditional designs. So right. I was yeah. wondering if they make up their own patterns. Uh, supposedly yeah. this was made around 1994, but again, Rowena Bradley had been uh, weaving her whole life. Yeah. Do you know what the purpose of, what, the basket was used for? Um, not this, this particular basket is called a planter, but I don't know any of us who would definitely use it as a planter. Uh, the planter. Yeah. Yes. But uh, that's how she yeah, identified right. it. But um, these are now not just functional, but they're obviously decorative. Mm. And, um, important. Well, well, it could be used as a planter with a another a base inside it, and the, the, this part would be the decorative part of the, the decorative planter. Again, a good question. Um, I don't know, but certainly I think you and I would protect the basket yeah. if we put something in it. Although, go so, ahead. 
I was going to say double weave baskets um, are almost right. watertight, so they, they can, can be used, be used as planters and be able to hold yeah. soil yes. and water. This one is obviously not 100% watertight because as Joey pointed out, there is some spacing in between the weave, but it's almost watertight. So it could definitely be used as a planter and probably better so without something inside of it to allow it for drainage. Be, be, um on the bottom part, it might be more watertight than it is on the part that's visible to us. Okay. I have a question about how it's made um, technique wise. I, I've, I've never really observed from soup to nuts basket weaving, but this is beautiful because the bottom looks like it's square, the top is round. Do they, are the uh, grasses or the reeds wet when they weave them or? to be, make them pliable or are they dry? Good, good question. I, I, all basket making that I know of is done wet uh, to give some flexibility to, to, the, um, to the materials. That's the only way that you really could shape them and also to get them tight. So I think that we'll move on to the next piece and then compare the two. Sound good, Christy? So, um, what are we seeing? Uh, well, let's take a few minutes and, and really take a look at this. So what is it that we're seeing here? I'm assuming it's a basket because you said it's a basket, but it, it really looks like an abstract person to me, like with legs. <laughs> okay, so, so you're seeing legs, are you seeing anything else that makes you see it as a person? Well, hair at the top, like a maybe a, you know, an abstract figurative picture of a person. Okay, an abstract person with legs and hair. Yeah. Good. Sandy? I can't. I can't stop ooing and aahing over this because of the complexity of of the composition and how difficult it must have been to make this. I'm, I find this fascinating, but I'm so glad we started with the basket beforehand so that I could grow with this one. Thank you, and thank you, Sandy. Good comments, but and certainly about a very different technique and a different level of complexity. And this one, it looks as if a mixture of materials. It, it doesn't look as if like the other would look like it was made of one particular weave with the cane and then the coloring. Here, you've got more than one going on. And I was just gonna say, I was intrigued by the first piece that it was symmetrical. It was 12 by 12 by 12. And where this here definitely doesn't have the same dimensions throughout. Good points. Um, very different style and structure. Um, and this idea that more than one material is used. I see your hand up, Ellen. This looks very primitive to me, as if it's a much older piece. Or if not, it's done in a very abstract, primitive way, even if it's more modern. I mean, I don't know, you know, the age and the information on it. So I'll wait to be surprised to see which one it goes. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> um, but, but good, it has a primitive vibe to you. And can you say more? What's primitive about it? Well, nothing is quite symmetrical. It looks very hand-done. Um, and um, there's a certain crudeness to it maybe I'm saying that with uh, quotes around it it's not a very polished piece where the other basket was much more polished mm -hmm. appearance good good Marion you're you're you can go you're unmuted great the um it's interesting the first one I immediately was drawn to the geometric designs but I my thoughts went to its functionality uh, and in fact, I was thinking about a basket I had that seemed very similar and what I used it for um, so that it was it was art, it was a piece of art, obviously, but it was also a util 
utilitarian piece of art. I look at this and it's just art. It's like awesome, you know, drawing. I'm like, I can't even imagine that there's a functionality, although it may be. So I'd be very interesting, interested to see that. So, it, but even um, the different materials and, you know, the, 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 the very uh, shredded, uh, Mm, I haven't got the right word, the, the, uh, the fibers at the top, you know, sort of take away from the sense of, hmm, this must have been a very functional piece at some, pe at some time period. So I look at it as more I, primitive modern. <laughs> <laughs> Good, Marianne. So primitive modern um, and that it seems more artistic to you. Um, so what would, to anybody, what would differentiate um, maybe a craft from an art? This looks very childlike to me, as if a, a child were experimenting and grabbing pieces of whatever they could find and just being very creative without much pre-thought in it. And it comes up really beautifully. Again, it, you see it both as primitive and infant. You know, like not child. infant, child. child like. Okay, okay, really good. Um, we know if the back is replicated, if the front is replicated on the back. Good question. Christy, do you know? I don't. I don't. I haven't seen this Laurel, and maybe two years and so it's not really fresh in my mind if the back and the front um, are mirrors of one another. And I have to add that I am as disadvantaged as you all. I have not seen these works in person. I wish we all could. Um, so we're working in essence with 3D objects on a, on a flat screen. Barbara? Yeah, Julie? I don't know about, I mean, it, it looks, it tends to look more like a, an artwork than a, a craft, but I'm, I'm it, the craft part, it looks like the woven, if that's woven, top piece is sewn on with those red uh, threads. Mm. So I don't know if that's what it is, but it looks like it's, it's sewn together. The, the clay base, if that's what it is, is sewn to the top portion. Good. Yeah, a couple of people in the chat. Um, I'm sorry, Barbara, I'm not keeping up very well because the conversation <laughs> is just flowing. Um, but there are several people that, like Joey, have commented about this sort of half and half feel um, to the basket, that it might be basket on top and ceramic at the bottom um, and maybe half functional, half artistic. So I think people are struck by the duality of this basket. Right. So uh, these are, go ahead, who's talking? Uh, Sandy, I, I wonder about an African spirit here. Um, we have African images in our museum right now. So I'm, I'm focused on Africa. It, the base to me seems African. Um, that, that would be my, my one. My first thought it was a modern piece, but now I'm just wondering if it is an African spirit. Good. Now that you're saying that, I would like to say that this, you know, when I opened up, it looks like a person with legs and it may be a woman because that could be the vagina that bought the, the oh. bottom um, thing yeah. and the legs and, and, the, and the top could be the, a mouth or the part of the face. Okay, good. We're, we're seeing, you know, perhaps different influences. And now back to the, uh, you know, it being uh, a figurine, we're seeing perhaps different body parts. I think I'm going to have us now compare the two baskets to make sure that we have time to do that. So, oh, well, okay, sorry. This first we'll talk specifically about this and the artist because this basket Thank was you. made in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. The um, slide nor the artist have identified what all the mixed media is other than handmade paper. Mm -hmm. We certainly look at the, what we've been calling the hair as definitely some sort of fiber. 
and the red lines that look like sewing as some sort of fiber. Mm -hmm. um, Anne Hall Richards, um, I like artist statements, so I'll tell you what, what she thought about her artwork. Um, using natural fibrous materials, I combine paper making, hand weaving, and stitching techniques to create works which are intuitive representations of emotional life experiences. Mm -hmm. Much of my work, I attempt to push the envelope. Um, and I found it very interesting that she was, she is a contemporary artist who has now moved on to interior design <laughs> with an emphasis on custom lighting. So um, why don't we put up the slide, Christy, of the two next to each other? And we call these both baskets. So what is it that, you know, what's the main thing we're going to say about the comparison or the contrast? Well, there's a bulbous center. They uh -huh. both they both go out in the center and then come back in. So they both have part of a similar shape. Yeah. What else? I think that the... Um, the original woven basket is very representational. It's representational of the culture. It's representational of a, a function and a, um, the geometric shape is representational. I think that, um, um, I forgot, Richard, the second basket is um, very interpretive. You know, uh -huh. I, I don't think that it, it's message. I think there is a message. And I love that she uh, talked about it and referenced it as emotional life experience because I would be drawn to this piece of art to interpret. Wow, what's going on? <laughs> Again, very good in, in, the, in the contrast that the first basket is, is very culturally representational. It is definitely a Cherokee basket. It looks like a Cherokee basket. Other baskets of Cherokee uh, that are Cherokee made resemble it. Where Ann Richards is more experimental, um, we thought it could be made at various times or of various cultures. Um, for me, the Cherokee basket is part of a legacy that um, the basket maker, as I said, pretty much made baskets her whole life. And Ann Richards, uh, the, the contemporary basket, sees herself more as an artist. And as we've seen, she's already moved on from this form. We may see something similar in our next two pieces. Any other um, comments before we move on, Judy? Yeah, I just wanted to add really quickly that after Joey said that it could be a vagina and that could be a woman and, you know, and the artists um, talking about representing emotions, I thought this could, this is really, could be interpreted as real feminist um, vessel making, a feminist okay. vessel. What makes it feminist? Because it's... Well, if there's a vagina and then there's either hair or an expression of feeling of some kind at the top, um, it's mostly the opening, mostly the opening, I think. And, you know, the, the sort of combination of possible cultural uh, art making legacies that sugge are suggested. I got a childbearing feeling when I looked at that. I looked, this mm. looks like an African artifact. And it, I don't know, I got a feminine vibe from it and, and something about childbearing. I don't know why, but I did. Good. Helen, you've got your hand up. Right. One thing I notice is that, and I, I keep looking at it, it's not very even where the basket everything is very symmetrical and the sides are balanced. If you look at the lines across the um, horizontal lines, they're all on a slant. And to me, that gives the uh, feel where I said before of the primitive or almost childlike look. And also the bottom, um, is that ceramic? Is it painted or is that paper? Because it looks like it's peeling and there's different layers there. 
It looks like to me, it looks very experimental as if, yes, she's on to other things or she's growing <laughs> and using this as a stepping stone. You know, that's a good point, Ellen. Barbara and I talked at the beginning um, about, you know, we know that there's handmade paper in this basket, but we were, you know, trying to figure out, is this the area that, that has the handmade paper? And I don't think that we had even thought about the fact that it could be the bottom um, part, which you're absolutely right. It could be the handmade paper that has then been, um, you know, hey, maybe put on. into a mold um, yeah. in order to form it and... Now you're making me want to go <laughs> and actually look at it and, and figure that out. I can't wait. I'm so I was going to say, we'd love to see the real piece. Yes. I am thrilled that both of these have evoked so many responses. I'm going to say two more things before we move on. One is that I have always found it fascinating that baskets can only be handmade. You cannot have a machine manufactured basket huh. where you can have machine made pottery or glassware. Um, so, and I could go off on that for two hours. <laughs> I was in correspondence with the uh, woman who heads the National Basketry Organization because I learned that fact over 30 years ago and I wanted to see if it was still true and we both searched 3D printing and couldn't find uh, an example of, of, of a basket made by 3D printing. The I was just gonna say quickly about the arts and crafts. You know, everyone always says arts and crafts, but I think art can be a craft and crafting can be an art. But looking at these two, I would say the basket is a craft as it was made. And I would say the other piece is a piece of art. Good, Laurel. There are so many different ways to distinguish art from craft. One of them, interestingly enough, is that a craft can be replicated. And so although I find the Cherokee basket artistic, you can teach the recipe. You can teach that much easier than you can with the Ann Richards. So that's a good point. The other thing I wanted to say, and Christy, I, I think you know this, is that both of these baskets were donated to the museum by the same person, a woman named Billy Ruth Sudoff, who was also a master basket maker. What's interesting about her is she left uh, being a school psychologist to take up a hobby of basket making. And she says that she had made over 10,800 baskets and kept track of every single purchase of, of her baskets, including the one from the Smithsonian. So I just wanted to credit her for expanding uh, the knowledge and the collection at the Asheville Museum. For sake of our discussions, we're gonna move on to the next piece made out of different fibers. Aha! So let's take a few moments and take a look at this. So, what is it that you see here? You know my questions by now. So what is it that we're seeing? Face. It's a face just comes off of that image for me. I see the mouth and the eyes and the hair. Good, um, Marian. So you're seeing a face. Uh, what makes you say that? What, what, what makes it a face? It's interesting that it was so stark to me the falling of the hair, the fringe, but it, uh, my first was drawn to them. What I perceived to be a mouth and lips, mm -hmm. and then the shape you want around. To point that out, Christy. Sorry, say that again. Do you want to point that out with your pointer? Sure, go ahead, Marion. So I was just, I was, I, my was drawn to the central circle, and that became a mouth and lips, and then, and then this sort of cape the drawing or the stitching around that became, draw me up to the hair. And um, I mean, I call it the hair because it just is such a, uh, 
just such an awesome representation to me. Kind of shaggy like mine keeps falling in my face. <laughs> shaggy hair. <laughs> um, Zoom user, I'm not sure what your name is. If you tell me your name, then I will change your name for you. But you also have your hand up. I'm not seeing that. Oh, Zoom. You, oh, Phyllis. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how. I, this is the first time I was able to comment because it took a while for me to figure out how to do it. Anyway, I wanted to comment about the color red and the fierceness that um, psychologically I attach to that color. I, I think this is um, got a very strong mask quality um, and that it, it's, it, it seems to be saying, you know, I'm a strong, fierce uh, woman and um, the title is, is Ruby Begonia. So Ruby for the red and Begonia, when I looked at the, at the mouth, at the, at the donut shape of the mouth and the, and the piece inside, the, it reminded me of a flower you know, with the purple being the petal area and the center being the seed area. So I think it's very fertile, very strong feminine uh, reference. Uh, very good. Um, again, uh, this is not just the, the shape, but the color um, evoking a fierceness, strength, and a mask-like quality. And I'm going to be a little bit personal for a second and say, hello, Phyllis. This is my hello, sister-in-law <laughs> calling in from Florida. And uh, she, and she hello, everybody. He is the family artist. <laughs> Sandy mm -hmm. and then Judy. <laughs> so I, my feeling was of a clown, fun, happy. <laughs> and I, I felt the clown because of all the the aroundness around the mouth and then around that and then the fiber thickness around that, the way clowns um, have those facial boundaries. So uh, yeah, to me it was a happy I love clown. That, Andy, because everybody <laughs> has like sort of a face-like, mask-like, but very, very different from fierce to fun, you know, clown-like. Mm -hmm. Um, who is next, Christy? Judy, then Ellen. Okay. So um, everything that everyone has mentioned, I can see in this, but to me, immediately and still, um, that's a vagina. And this is, again, I'm on with the feminist, uh -huh. feminist art, but really, really, this one looks like 70s feminist art to me. And, I, and the shape of it... Um, I know it's meant to be hung. I assume it's meant to be hung, but the shape reminds me of those, are they called sporins that, that I don't the know. Scottish, yes. you know, right? Scottish, yes. uh, the Scottish quilt, the, um, and I think only men wore this, but the, it hung down below the waist and sort of covered the genital area. And I imagine, you know, the other societies have similar things and, um, so I, so I, I really see this as both a face and a vaginal um, depiction. Very good, Judy. Uh, very Judy, Chicago-ish, 1970s. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all those. So again, um, a different body part. Mm -hmm. Ellen? I have, well, one question is, is I, it looks like to me, it looks like it's a, a wall, hang, almost a wall hanging. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, is that I was going back and forth. Is it vaginal or is it facial when I was looking at it? But the fact that it has teeth makes me think that it's facial. Um, but it is, it's very vivid. And I wouldn't say angry, but bright. Um, you know, it's like, notice me, maybe because of all the, the use of the red and the purple. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't really think it's specifically angry or, or, and it's not specifically happy. It could be anything that we want it to be. So it is very I see, in that way. 
Yeah. I see a puppy dog. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I honestly think the little button nose and the shagginess. <laughs> I, I know a dog isn't red and purple, but it's represented <laughs> to me. I just see like a little puppy dog there. Yeah. I had the exact same feeling. I was going to say that. It, the first thing that struck me, it was like this uh, friendly dog face, totally different than what other people are saying. Well, I have a wheat interior, and I absolutely thought dog. <laughs> I'm not going to take this over, but I like that it evokes different things for different people. Yeah. I'm also going to throw out, before we look at the identification slide, this piece is six feet by almost, six, it's almost six by six. Wow. It's gigantic. Um, so does that at all, maybe we should go to the other slide, Christy. Oh, Before I, we do, I'm sorry, uh, Barbara, I, Barbara Stickle, I think that you had a comment oh, and we had a comment. Let her in. Oh, I was just going to say, I saw the puppy dog also and I see the eyes hidden behind the the fringe. It's like one of those dogs where you can hardly see their eyes. I forget what brand that breed they are where their eyes are hidden and I can see one sort of peeking. Holding <laughs> a sheepdog. <laughs> and Judy, did you have a last comment? Yeah, I just I just wanted to point out, I find this interesting, this conversation interesting, thinking back to the Cherokee basket and then the vessel. Um, Richards, I think is her name. Yeah, yeah, Russell, and, and, mm -hmm. yeah and then this one, um, how our conversation has changed so much from technique um, and pattern identification, that sort of thing, to interpretation. And, and these pieces have gotten more and more, I don't know, arty, abstract, whatever you want to call it. But, they, but it's interesting how uh, the traditional doesn't evoke a whole lot of conversation about what is that, whereas, because the patterns are completely geometric and abstract, yet these pieces are abstract in their conception. Mm -hmm. And good, just, good point, just thought it was interesting. Right, it's, that's a good point. There were, there were very different kinds of structures. Um, let's take a look at what the artist uh, thought about this. So as I'm going from uh, the image to the label, Diane had pointed out in the chat box, uh, a lot of people have commented on sort of the teeth and the mouth and some people have um, identified this in the form of a vagina, but she reminds us that there is a form called a vagina dentata, a vagina with teeth. Ah, wow. <laughs> Very good. So this, uh, as um, Phyllis mentioned, is called Ruby Begonia. Um, and so we get maybe an idea again of that flower, if that's what the artist meant in the title. It is large. Um, and again, um, this person, this artist, uh, Sue Ferguson, uh, is a weaver. Then she considers this a tapestry made out of different fibers. Like a lot of weavers, she started out making scarves and placemats. And then she found what's called a siori, which is a free form type of weaving. Um, she works at a rigid heddle loom, which is very much just plain weave, just in and out. Um, she says, imagination and hope drive my selection of fibers and colors. The pieces I create are often messy with untrimmed strands of yarn dangling everywhere. You certainly see that. I favor the unkempt asymmetrical form. It reflects the way I see and navigate the world. So um, again, that gives us a sense of, doesn't answer all our questions. <laughs> but certainly gives us a sense of what she is thinking and feeling as she is creating a piece like this. Anything else before we move on to our last slide? Okay. Now, finally, let's take some time to, to look at this. So, 
what is it that you see? I would just like to be the first to say that this does not remind me of a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Marty, good comment. <laughs> I don't know, I think I could make one out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the colors, the purples, the greens, the, the, the multiple shades of the different colors of the browns and the beiges, and just the, um, I guess that, I don't know if it's the texture or the accordion effect there really um, is very nice. Good, good. I, I, so you've come. I see. One second. I just want to acknowledge that Laurel has talked both about the colors, but also about this accordion effect, which we'll get back to. I'm sorry for cutting whoever I cut off. Oh, it's, it was it's Billy. Billy, and I don't have my video on. You're okay, no. Billy. Okay, um, but I I see an I'm an agricultural landscape. Uh huh. Yes. With water and rose and and green and uh, but the fact that it's done if if we could stand and what I'd like to be able to do is stand far to the right of it and far to the left of it. Exactly. Uh -huh. And see exactly. how it would look to me. Yes. Is it a wall, is it a screen, a large standing screen taken you know, from the original you know, um, Asian Ellen? designs? Ellen, can I answer that a little bit later? Let's just get a little oh. bit more about what people initially see, and then we'll fill in the blanks. Like Susan, hold on, Joey, uh, Susan, then Joey. It looks like you could fold it up if mm -hmm. it was paper and get two different uh, scenes. Please. The Ginger? blue, more mm -hmm. of a water scene, the green, more of a field. And I, I agree with the person who said, I wish I could stand to different sides of it. Mm. Because I think you'd get a completely different um, feeling about it. And you could almost make the blue part disappear. And then you go around the corner and it's there again. Very good observations about that. That sense of that maybe there's more than one image and that depending on where you stand, what it is that you're gonna see is different. Joey, go ahead. Yeah, just, uh, you know, to reiterate what Billy said, I see an uh, agrarian farmland scene on the, the one angle, on the other angle, more of a natural mountain scene with a river with no human intervention. <laughs> So, so again, really good, Joey, th that, that sense of these are two different landscapes. Marion? And, and, go ahead. <laughs> Marion? Oh, okay, great. I, I, um, I saw a landscape for your question, but the difference in the others, and I, um, I experienced it, like, and so the, the dimensional effect um, made me step, it was not just that I could view this landscape, but I could enter this landscape. Um, and I loved that. It was immediately experiential to me. I could just move in and, and it was a very uh, contemplative type experience. So. Good. Good. Judy? Um, so in the chat, Elaine said the image is dominant and recessive. And maybe, maybe that uh, speaks to what you were just saying about uh, it being experiential. But I wondered what Elaine meant or what she sees in, in this that makes her say it's dominant and recessive. Um, there, there's a name for something where you see that it's not necessarily the three-dimensional idea like this is, but that type of image where you look at it and you see it one, it's one picture, like it's an old woman and another picture, ah. it looks like something else. So the first time I looked at this, I only saw the water scene that that was the dominant and the, and the field was reset, was recessive. And now I'm probably saying the same thing that y'all are saying, but it, it's the same thing, but there's a name for that. Optical I, illusion. Uh, yeah, but there's another, there's well, a more the name, Elaine, you're onto something. Yeah. Um, I think that you were describing an optical illusion, but what this is called is an, uh, a, <laughs> I can't pronounce it. A, a gamma, gamma graph. graph. 
a gamma graph. Okay, yeah. And, and it, w it was created by an artist called Yaakov Agam, an Israeli painter who basically did this in paint where in one piece, you would see two different scenes depending mm -hmm. on what angle you're looking mm -hmm. at. But this piece, as we'll see a little bit later, does have dimension where Agam himself did it flat. Right, I yeah. Wish that, um, we have a docent named uh, uh, Joan um, Dinerman, who used to do paintings in strips that gave that kind of image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who was well, next, Christy, on our list? Think, Judy, talked. did you have your hand up or were you just sort of gesturing no. to? <laughs> I had my hand up. I did. I had sorry, my hand no, up. Sorry, no, not Judy of John, Judy Spark. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. It looked like Judy uh, Spark, you might have had your hand up. I'm sorry. I was just trying to look and uh, see what that word was because I'd never heard it. I don't oh, okay. I put it in the chat box if you'd like oh, to. Good. Thank you, Chris. See how it's spelled. Yes. So, okay. So I wanted just to um, ask everyone, why do you, I mean, I, I also see the um, water first and the sky. Mm -hmm. Well, the sky is, I guess, in both versions, but I see the water before I see the, the ground version. And, and I wonder why that is. I see the farmland. If that's, what? Money? What, He's Joy? The farm I see the farmland first. Ah. Now, I admit I have some visual distortion in my eyes, but it took me, I could not find the water that people were referring mm -hmm. to until the very last person spoke. Mm -hmm. It's sort of interesting. I was so caught on the interior. I go again to what the back might look like. I mean, I always think I know <clears> this <throat> and it's something that's three dimensional. Like, is the back a, a mirror image? Can you s turn it around? And uh, I almost want to fold it like a fan because it looks to me like the strips connect to each mm -hmm. other. Like if you connected each of those five strips that are toward in the foreground, the picture would be connected. I mean, that's fascinating the way that's done to me. That's why and it, it would like be all water. If you Christy, in, in the benefit of time, why don't we put the idea up about mm -hmm. this piece? Yeah, um, before I do that, Barbara, I would just invite everyone to take your eyes all the way down to the bottom of the image mm -hmm. and look at the shadows. And it's gonna give you a clue as to how this works. Do you see now how it's constructed? Mm -hmm. it, that's why I just kept saying it looks like a, a standing screen. Yeah, it's like a relief map. Mm -hmm. Again, um, Grinnell came to the Western North Carolina area in 65 as a student on scholarship to go to the Penland School where she later became an instructor. She died at the age of 57. The most, the best material about her online is a tribute her husband wrote oh. after her death. Um, but what I would like to add is she called her type of weaving eccentric tapestry. Um, it has the appearance of many pieces stitched together, but it has dimension. Uh, like all of you, I wish I could see this in person. This is, I think, my favorite piece. Sure. Um, but for our few minutes, oh, the other thing I wanted to say, like a lot of other contemporary artists, at the end of her life, she went back to painting and was giving up weaving. I was very surprised at that. Um, but why don't we put up the two um, tapestries, Christy? Aha, so which do you like best and why? <laughs> Barbara, what was the size of this, this the, um, the accordion one? That's big, isn't it? It's 72 by 57 and it's, uh, it's width is almost six inches. So it comes, it, there is dimensionality. It's depth, yeah. They're, so they're about the same size. The um, mm -hmm. one on the left is a little bit smaller, but they're both very large and hang on the walls. 
Is it me? Okay, that was the question I was going to have. Um, I keep seeing this as a standing piece. No, it's okay. a, it's so a wall it's sculpture. Up on, it meant, it's meant to be up on a wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, Ellen. You were talking about it as a, a screen. Screen. And having yes, that a standing kind of screen. Right. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, Ellen, I think, oh, and Laurel, because you had asked about the back. If I'm not mistaken, the back is purely for hanging. Um, it doesn't have sort of a, it's not fully three-dimensional, I don't think. I've only seen it uh, one time. Which, so is often, which is often the case with weavings. Right. Is, is it connected? Are the, uh, are the different the piece, piece on the, it's one piece. Okay, so. I, actually, I'm not sure, Barbara. I actually think it might be five separate pieces that are meant to be hung together, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Okay. From what I've read about her work, she developed a technique. So maybe this piece is different. Yeah. But this this is the what she was known for. This is what right. stops me. Ah. Okay. Maybe because it comes out from the wall. No, you mm. see that white strip yeah. of wall right, right there. there. Yes. That's why I think it might be five separate pieces. But uh, gosh, if I knew that we were going to um, need that information and to know about the back, I would have asked. So I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. I wish Could I did. Could it even be ten separate pieces? I think that it's five separate pieces, and each one is sort of uh, a long pyramid. Yeah, I have a question about the second one. It looks to me like um, a, raw, a carpet, a texture to it. Is that what it is? The way well, it's woven? Again, I haven't seen it in person, but I do know it's made out of wool, cotton, and linen. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the... Um, uh, how wide or you know thin each material is. I assume that the wool is thicker than the linen, but that's only an assumption. If it's five separate pieces and they're hung together, you could hang them in a different order and it would make a different picture. I don't know that for sure, but I think, Laura, I think that it's five separate pieces. All I know is that most of her pieces were woven as one. Mm -hmm. This could be an exception because it's not flat, but it, it does say about her work, it has the appearance of many pieces stitched together, has dimension, and you get the different views from where you stand. Um, so Christy and I are going to have a bidding match when we're back in the museum together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to get it pulled out or get it um, in an exhibition. And, and I did talk to our registrar because, of course, one wants to see if you can't see it in person, you want to see what does it look like if you're standing to one side versus the other side. So he said, well, let's try and get that up on the wall so that we can get those pictures for posterity. Um, Phyllis, you've got your hand up. Just unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to comment that uh, when uh, two pieces are together, when the f five pieces are together, it almost creates um, a, a new landscape um, reminiscent of, you know, a serene and tranquil time in life where um, I find it to be exciting and relaxing. And somebody mentioned the, about why the water comes forward at first. And I think it's because the lighter colors, the whites and the light blues, um, your eye perceives them as in the foreground and the darker recede to the, to the background. And that's probably why when we first look at, at this piece, the white and the light blue comes forward first, you notice them first. There's also contrast between, in the sky, between the white and the dark blue. Mm -hmm. And so your eye perceives that the water and the, and the sky are coming forward and the mountains and the, and the grass are, are in the background. But for me, it just creates a whole experience of a new, um, of a new landscape. Good points. Um, I, I especially wanted to comment about how certain colors or colors together 
pop out um, and others recede. But I, I like that again, this felt like a relaxing um, to you. And somebody on the chat just wrote that the other one, you know, that it looked too busy. Any other ending comments? I think, Christy, we're getting uh, towards our end. We have two hands up and we are out of time. So if you could just make your uh, comments brief, uh, Judy and then Ellen. Yeah, this might be a weird comment, but I'm just thinking about the sequence and comparisons. Um, mm -hmm. And this last piece reminds me of the Cherokee basket in that um, there are definite patterns mm -hmm. and it's, it's not symmetrical, but the shape, the form of it is very symmetrical. That's all. Good, good point, because two of them, two of the pieces were like more abstract and two were more exacting, perhaps. Exacting, right. And uh, Ellen? Ellen? I was going to direct this question, I think, I think at Christy or maybe at Barbara or both of you. This was the piece that you featured in the invitation. And right. my question is, is what made you choose this piece as opposed to any of the others? The one on the far right? Yes. Because I really like this one. <laughs> so I made it the featured image. It's purely, <laughs> purely subjective. <laughs> That's why I, I was wondering that. In other words, this is me. I'm going to say this is your favorite. <laughs> This is one of the ones that when it's hanging, I really love to go look at it. And um, we I also tend to use a lot with tours because you can get the, especially with kids, you can get them active by, you know, standing them on one side and having them move to the other um, mm -hmm. and, and talk about sort of optical illusions and, and playing with your eyes. And it's just really nice. It's always good conversation. I just want to take a moment and thank all of you for coming and hope that you will attend other things from the museum. I know that we have many locals here. I see people from Cape Cod and New York and Florida um, as well. Um, and so you're always welcome to be part of our virtual programs. And just so that you know, Sandy uh, dials in from Montana and Lynn oh. dials in from London and Anil is in West Virginia. So we're all coming in. Oh, and Susie, you're also calling in from Montana. So we're calling in from a lot of places. Thank you so much. Great. <laughs> And Great. thank you, Barbara, for leading today's conversation and for choosing artworks. A lot of times, uh, as some of you know, that uh, come uh, on a regular basis, we tend to choose a lot of uh, narrative works because we love to pull out the stories. Um, and I think that we had some really great conversations today about these artworks that not only are non-narrative, but are also not paintings or drawings or prints. So thanks, Barbara, for being courageous and choosing some uh, out-of-the-box artworks. Uh, next week, uh, our topic is listening to the animals, and our uh, docents Hank Bovey and Jim Crook have chosen four artworks uh, from our collection uh, that all feature animals. We have a sculpture, uh, a hand-colored photograph, a print, and a large-scale Polaroid by an artist uh, who um, will probably look familiar to a lot of you. So please uh, join us uh, next week by signing up. Uh, it's live now on our website and you'll get the April lineup in your inbox next week as well. Have a great week, everyone. Always a pleasure. Take care. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks.